All right. Welcome, welcome. So go ahead and uh, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at verse 6. That is the topic of our union with Christ, which is us being raised us up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. So that is the aspect of our union with Christ that we'll be talking about today. And so we'll be looking at what it means to be raised with Christ. We did touch on that a bit when we looked at Romans and how we were baptized into Christ, um, baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. And so that some of that will be familiar to us, but then this whole concept of being seated with Christ, what does that mean? What does that mean for us today? What does that mean for us in our future? So what I want to do is get the context or get the sense of where Ephesians 2, 6 falls. And it falls in um, the first, this first thought of Paul in chapter 2, which is really a long sentence. And the interesting thing is, is verse 6 is actually the main point. Um, but I want to read for us chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, just to, to get the context of what Paul is talking about here. And then we'll get into the details. So follow along as I read, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to, you know, I'm going to pause for a second here. So this is Sunday school, we can do this kind of thing. So um, what's interesting about Ephesians chapter 2 is that it is everyone's testimony. Every Christian, it's your testimony. The details of how God specifically drew you to himself is different, but every one of us can identify with the realities of what happens here in Ephesians chapter 2. So think about that. Think about your life before being saved. Think about what God did to draw you to himself and, and what your life is to be like after. It's all rooted here in these 10 verses. So I'm going to start over. I'll start over at, at verse 1. And you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. The spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all also formerly conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And so you see here in these ten verses, you see what our nature was before um, before being saved, you see what God did to intervene in our lives and to save us, the, the motivation and purpose of that salvation, and then the benefits and responsibilities of that salvation. But it's interesting, when we come to this text, and we often do, it's something that is, I think, revisited often because it's so rich and full of amazing things about our salvation, about who we are in Christ, about what God has done for us. And so we, we visit it often, but it's interesting that as we do, we, we highlight and major on the things about uh, our nature before Christ, right? That we were dead in our transgressions, that we followed the course of this world, that we were by nature children of wrath. And that speaks to, and we often talk about, our total depravity or our total inability to respond to God apart from his work in our lives. We also talk about um, monergism. You may be like, what is monergism? Okay, monergism states that regeneration of an individual is the work of God through the Holy Spirit alone. Mono being 
one, and it is God and God alone that saves the individual. It is his work and his work alone that brings us to himself. And so we talk about that, and that will become clear as we work through this text as well. And that, of course, salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, and it's not through works. This is a cornerstone doctrine of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It is the key to the church and the church, and church history. It is what separates us, as, as uh, Josh is, is um, often pointing out, not often in the back, but he often points out the difference, <coughs> rightly so, of, of what we believe um, and what we le- believe as Protestants compared to what the Catholic Church teaches We believe in a salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then, of course, this distinction between, well, where do works come into play? Are works required for salvation? No, right? It's by grace alone. Um, But they are, they are the the fruit of our salvation. It is a, a necessary consequence of our salvation that we would have good works. And as a matter of fact, God prepared those good works for you to walk in, specifically for you as a Christian. Um, So you can think about that God, uh, Josh, John, and I can go on and name all of you, um, God has prepared works for you in this life that you would walk in them. And so good works are merely the, the evidence of a regenerated heart, a heart that loves God and wants to please God. And so, however, those realities of salvation are critical, and they are rooted in our text, but it's not the main point of this passage. And as I, as I um, studied this and getting ready for this morning, some of the things I came across really had this stand out for me in a new way, in a way I'm thankful for in terms of seeing what Paul is trying to communicate. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly touch on that and then get back to um, our union with Christ. But as I mentioned, our section begins in verse 1 and starts with, and you were. And much like when we read, therefore, when you come across something like this, it points you back to what was said before. And and this phrase is tying you closely to what came before in in the context of chapter 1, as opposed to the whole of what Paul is talking about. And so it's really connecting us back to verses 17 through 23. So let's go ahead and read that together. Paul says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the full knowledge of him, so that you, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of the might of his strength. And notice what he's talking about in verse 19, the surpassing greatness of his power. And of course, at the bottom part of verse 19, working of the might of his strength, which he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so these verses highlight the victory and power of God over all things in Christ and as Christ as head of the church, right? It, it, the, the power of God and what he accomplished, it just, it just jumps out of these verses. And as one theologian noted, the main point of chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is that God has empowered Christ to be the head of the church, giving him victory over all things. And that power intersects our lives. That power is not only for us to understand that we are saved by grace through faith alone, but it puts all points back to the surpassing preeminence of God in Christ. And the focus is not on us in verses 1 through 10. He did it all by himself. The main character is Christ and the magnification of his power. The description of our nature in verses 1 through 3 only highlights the reality that we were completely incapable 
of addressing our need, that we, would, that we could not have been a part of the process. Intrinsically, we were not worth the sacrifice. And if you interfere with it, if you, if you try to be a part of it, if you say that you have some, some part of your salvation, then it undermines the, the, the focus of God and his power to accomplish all things. If you say that you are a part of your salvation, then it, it makes him less glorious because you're exalting yourself in the process. You're giving yourself something to boast about. And if we look at the purpose in verse 7, right? What is the motivation behind verses 1 through 6 in chapter 2? It's so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The salvation that he brings in verses 1 through 7 is for God's glory. It's to magnify his grace, his mercy, his kindness. It is not to glorify and exalt us. So who is your salvation ultimately about, beloved? It's about God's glory. And I know saying something like that goes against the grain of our flesh. It goes against the grain of our culture and perhaps maybe things that we've been taught in our past but nonetheless, it is deeply rooted in the pages of Scripture that all of life, all things are from him and through him and to him. To him alone belongs the glory, and that pertains to our salvation greatly. And if you, we won't do it now, but if you go through the, the, the beginning of Ephesians in chapter 1, again, it's to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. All those things that he has done for us or to the end, that he would be glorified. And so we see that in verses, especially 20 through 23 of chapter 1, that it's all about Christ and what he accomplished in coming to earth, dying, and what he has restored, and the victory that he has won, and he did that all through his power. And his power continues to be displayed in verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. That's where the power and the victory that he won intersects with our lives, right? And it's, it's that power that is the central focus of 2, 1 through 10. Not so much about all the things that are related to that, but God demonstrating his power for his glory. And that power and victory intersects our own lives and raises us up with him and seats us with him in the heavenly places. So now what I want to do um, in the time that we have left this morning and in really understanding our union was to, to consider three things. Number one, what Christ accomplished in verses 1, 20 through 23, and just briefly stepping back and, and orienting our thinking on the great things that God has accomplished. And then in verses 2, 1 through 5, how we were incorporated into Christ. How we were incorporated into Christ. And then number three, what it means to be raised and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So this is really more just, a, instead of an applicational outline this morning, it's really more about just trying to understand how, how all of this is happening and affecting our union with Christ and, and then what that means for us to be seated with him in the heavenlies. So again, I want to take us back to um, chapter 1, 20 through 23, and let's talk about what Christ accomplished in these verses and, and just remind us of the larger narrative of Scripture that is actually being accomplished here. Uh, but we'll do that briefly. So if we go back to chapter 1, verse 20, reminding ourselves, again, he's, Paul said, which he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things, to the church. And so when you look at verse 20, and, and he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead. So that is, that is the means by which God did this. And what did he do? He seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And what, what does that mean for us? What did, what did he accomplish? 
And having sat down, he's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. And that speaks to his rule, his authority, his position of reigning and being the king and his power. And so what he came, he came to restore something that was broken. And if we remember back in, in Genesis 1 in the fall, right, God created man. He created man uh, to have perfect shell fellowship with himself. He gave man dominion over all the earth to rule the earth. And creation was subject to him. Again, he had perfect fellowship with God. He had dominion over the earth. And, he, and creation was subject to man. And that was a state in which God created us. And that was the design. And we all know what happened, though. We don't know exactly how long after, but not too long. There was rebellion, right? Adam and Eve sinned against God. They rebelled against God. And in doing so, they spiritually died that day they sinned against God and started to physically die. With that sin introduced death, and with death, corruption. And all of creation fell under that curse. All of creation was broken. So not only was man dead spiritually and began to die physically, but beyond that, all of creation was broken. Their rule and authority over the world was marred and lessened. Their dominion was broken. All of humanity fell in Adam. We've talked a lot about being identified with Adam as our federal head. And when he fell, we all fell. And when he died, our, we all died in a sense. Now we all are born with a corrupt nature. We are all born spiritually dead and separated from God. And now Satan has rule over this world. We just read in Ephesians 2, 1, that he is the ruler, the prince of the power of the air. He is the one that has authority in this world. Yes, that authority is ultimately subject to God, but he is ruling this world. And so that, that was the state, right? You have uh, a broken fellowship with God. We are spiritually dead, separated from God. Um, our original design to have dominion of this world is broken. Creation no longer uh, willingly submits itself to us. There's pain in childbirth. Yes, you're welcome for that. And uh, welcome. Um, and I, I, I've been there four times. It's not a pretty picture. I mean, it is. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But at the same time, it's painful. That's what I meant. My wife was beautiful. She The whole time. The whole time. Okay, I'll just move back and move on. I think it's fine. <laughs> but all of that, you know, you have to toil and work. Um, and, and so that was the state that this world was in. And it was a, a desperate and, and um, utterly hopeless situation. There needed to be a remediation. There needed to be a way to correct what was broken at the fall. And there is a way. And so the God who was offended by that fall also provided a way to make it all right. And that is through the person of Christ. And so Christ, as the second Adam, he came. He was, he was the perfect God-man, truly God and truly man. He was the perfect re representative on our behalf, right? Because there was no one who was born since Adam who is perfect. But we needed a perfect representative to die. And the only way that would happen is with God, who is perfect, would become man and live a perfect life. And that's exactly what Christ did. And he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to pay the debt of sin and rebellion. And he absorbed the wrath of God for the elect. And through his resurrection came victory over sin and death. And he sat down at the right hand of God, symbolizing complete power, authority, victory, and rule. And he restored what was lost. He now has complete dominion, and all things are subject to him. And he is on the throne in the heavenlies, 
At this very minute, at this very hour, and one day, this world will fully and be completely subjected to him, and his enemies will be made a footstool for his feet. And so while he is in heaven, he is reigning, he is ultimately sovereign, but his full reign is still yet to come, and this world is still yearning for a new heaven and a new earth. And it was interesting, I was listening to uh, a Piper sermon yesterday, not not related to this passage, but it struck me, if you think about this, um, Adam and Eve fell. They committed one sin. And you would think, well, what does does, um, the universe, what does the world have to do with what Adam and Eve did? What what does earthquakes and volcanoes and... and, um, And floods, all of that have to do with when Adam and Eve fell. And he he put forward his explanation, which I thought was, was very interesting to think about. Because we can easily and tangibly connect when we see uh, disasters happen in the world. We're affronted. We're, we are humbled. We're aghast at the destruction that happens through natural disasters and, and the brokenness of this world, the decay in this world. And it is a very visible example of the death and decay and brokenness of our sin and brokenness with God. And it was such an affront to the living God that not only did we all spiritually die in Adam, but all of creation was broken. And so that that is the world that Christ came back into to be the Savior. And he won for us that dominion that we lost in Adam. And he now reigns, and because we are in Christ, we will reign with him. So that that is just a, a bit of what Christ accomplished in verses 20 through, 20 through 23. And that is the power of God that was able to accomplish that. It was the power of God to overcome what was lost in the fall and to restore our dominion. It is the power of God that will subject all things under himself. It is the power of God that raised him from the dead, that raised him into heaven, that he is seated there. And it is that power that intersects with our own lives in that mission. So let's look at that now in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2. And I'll read it again for us. Uh, So we're going to look at uh, 1 through 3, our desperate condition. And in verses 4 and 5, our gracious rescue. So our desperate condition in verses 1 through 3 and our gracious rescue in 4 through 5. And all of that speaks to how we were incorporated into Christ. And so again, at verse 1 of chapter 2, and you were, right? So that's the connection in verses 20 through 23. This is all that God accomplished in Christ. He is reigning, and he is victorious, and you were. And now this is your condition, that that power is going to intersect in our lives. Because you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. This is your desperate condition. And so let's just walk through verses 1 through 3 and have a better understanding of this desperate condition. It starts with the fact that we were dead. We were dead. We, this, is, this is not, and you were becoming dead. This is not, and you might be dead. Or you might be partially alive, right? What does it say? And you were dead. And so when we think about how do we understand as, as those who are incorporated in the second Adam and our nature and our um, ability to have fellowship with God, to please God, this verse helps us understand what our nature was, what our condition was before being saved. We were dead. And so a dead person does not get up and walk around. A dead person doesn't contribute to anything. All it does is continue to rot and to stink and to smell, right? We were all spiritually dead. And so even though as soon as we're born, our bodies begin to physically die, 
We are born spiritually dead, spiritually incapable of making ourselves right with God, spiritually incapable of reaching out to God and asking for salvation. We are spiritually incapable of fellowship with him in this state because spiritually we are dead. And what were we dead in? We were dead in our transgressions and sins. And so when we're born, we are born with a corrupt nature, a bent toward evil, a bent towards sinfulness. And so do we have freedom? You do have freedom. You have freedom that is bound to your nature. And so your freedom is always going to choose a path that is in rebellion against God. How do I know that? Well, we just got to keep reading. So you were dead in your transgressions and sins, right? Transgressions is, is about a misstep. It's, it's about crossing the line. It is about who we were was on a path that was in rebellion against God, who was seeking to go against God's will, to cross the line against God. And we were dead in transgressions and sins. Sins is wrongdoing. So yes, God is holy and he has a standard, but we were born dead spiritually and our bent was only towards transgressions and sins. Now, does this mean that, that we manifest the full reality of what we would call depravity, the full potential of our evil? No, not. We are all by nature dead and incapable of being made right with God and having fellowship with God but we don't all manifest the full potential of that nature, right? And, and there are some remnants of our ability to do things that are what we would consider good in the sight of one another, right? I can, I can as a parent, I can do acts of sacrifice and love for my child. But all of that is still born out of a corrupted nature that is ultimately seeking self. But there are elements where... Um, there are expressions of, of what we would consider goodness, but we cannot say that any one of us are good in terms of our relationship to God and our ability to please God. And so we were all dead in transgressions and sins. And what did we do? We were not just passively dead. We were actively um, against God because we walked. We were formerly walking according to the course of this world. And so we were dead, and now we followed a corrupt path. We followed a corrupt path in which we walked according to the course of this world. This world, what do we mean by that? This world is um, the system of beliefs and affections and focus that is against God. It's the, the world system, its beliefs, its attitudes, its goals, its desires that all are against who God is. That's the world system. It's an anti-God system. And so we walked according to that, right? We, we were in transgressions and sins. We wholeheartedly and joyfully walked on a path that was against God. So we formally walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. And that's speaking about Satan. Satan has authority in this world, and he is actively setting up systems and belief systems and philosophies that are against God. He is working against God in this world in vast ways that even now tempt the Christian to have affections that are for this world and a focus on this world instead of the things above. So he is actively working in this world and we're following suit with the world system that he has set up that is against God. And then finally, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. When you see this, this, this spirit that was in us that is um, uh, associated with the same that is working in the sons of disobedience, when you see sons of disobedience, we think about putting on a Jewish mindset, right? And I am the son of thunder, I am the son of Zebedee. That is a way of identifying who you are. And so our very identity uh, before Christ were sons of disobedience. It was our very nature and identity be disobedient to the true and living God. Now verse 3, 
and among whom we all formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And so we've talked about our corrupt path, and now our corrupt, our corrupt conduct. Right? If, if, if you're still challenging the fact that there was any good in us before Christ that had some ability to want or desire God, you just have to keep reading. Keep reading. Among whom we also formerly conducted ourselves. It was the pattern of our life. It was the pattern of our heart. It was the pattern of our mind. It was a pattern of our actions in the lust of the flesh. John says in, in 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Right? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. All sin can be, all sin and temptation can be boiled down to those three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And that is what we wholeheartedly pursued in some shape, way, or form. We conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. And we did the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were, we were led about on a leash by our own fleshly desires. And we wholeheartedly pursued them with all of our being and all of our effort. We followed the flesh. We did the desires of the flesh. Those things of the flesh that are anti-God, that are not subject to God, that are not pleasing to God. Those lusts. Those are the things that we did, and it, it characterized all of our life. And so we did the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Those things that our corrupt mind thought about, we did them. And so what was our nature as a result of all this? What was our condition? How did we sum up that this rebellious heart attitude that was born out of a spiritually dead and corrupt heart? And verse 3 ends, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. And so all of us, before Christ, are under God's wrath. Our, our very natures are such a, an affront to God that, that the very wrath of a God is abiding upon those who do not know Christ. All that they are guaranteed and promised is wrath. And so that's our nature, our, our desperate condition. We were dead in transgressions and sins. We, we had a, a corrupt path, and we followed the course of this world wholeheartedly. We submitted ourselves under the authority of Satan's rule as it's carried out in this anti-God world. And we were by nature children of disobedience. It was our nature to go against God. And we, we were let loose with our corrupt conduct and we we followed after it we pursued it zealously and we did the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we were under god's wrath and that is a desperate condition is it not is there anything in verses one through three that you heard that would be pleasing to god that would make us something that god would want to save is there anything that's, that's naturally uh, creating and stirring up the affection of God by the quality and character of our lives before being saved? The answer is no. There is none good. There is none righteous. There is none that seek for God. And friendship with the world is hostility to God. And we weren't just friends with the world. We were in love with the world. And we pursued the world with all of our being. And, and that means we were at war with God. And you may not think that God was at war with you, or that you were at war with God, but God was at war with you. You had his wrath upon you. And so this is our state. And that's a horrible place to be. But that brings us to our gracious rescue in verses 4 and 5. But God... There, there is probably, and, and you've heard it maybe if you've heard a message on this before, but that is one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture. And you can only see that as one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture if you fully understand and embrace the depth of wickedness that is described in the first three verses. You're never going to have uh, an amazing grace or an amazing salvation until you know how holy God is and how utterly sinful we are, how utterly incapable we are in our own to be made right with God or do anything that pleases Him. 
Because that is what sets the stage for the amazing power that intersects in our lives to save us. But God. But God. And what does it say? Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now notice, it does not stay, say, but God, because we had something in us that drew his attention, that we had something in us that was noble, that we had something in us that was worth sending his son to die. It does not say that. Instead, instead it says, by his rich mercy, because of his great love. It was his mercy and his love that he set his affections upon you in Christ. This was all a work of God, but God, not but us who worked our way to God, not but us who had some merit and ability to reach out to God. It doesn't say that. It is God who is moving in this verse, and he is moving because of his rich mercy and his great love. It was despite our utter wickedness and gross rebellion that he acted it was not the loveliness that we brought to the table, but it is a love that chose us despite how rebellious and wicked we all were. It is a mercy that overcomes our repulsion or his repulsion to our very nature. And so it is his grace, his mercy, his kindness that saved us, but God. And then it says, just to refresh our memories, even when we were dead in our transgressions. That's right. He is talking to you about the fact that we were utterly destitute, wicked, evil, and rebellious. But it is his great mercy and love. Even when we were in that state, what did he do? Because we were dead, were we not? So what did he do? He made us alive. And how? How can he do that? There is only one way that the living and holy and just God could make a dead sinner alive. There is only one way that a holy and just God can make a rebellious sinner who is spiritually dead alive. And that is, he made us alive together with Christ. And so no wonder it is by grace in verse 5 that you have been saved. That is what grace is. It is it's God's powerful and unilateral intervention in our lives for his glory. And so it is the great grace of God because it was nothing we could do. We weren't just neutral, but we were dead and rebellious. And so there was nothing we could do. And here's the thing, there's nothing we wanted to do. What did we want to do? We wanted to follow the course of this world and to indulge in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's what we wanted to do. And we were rebellious against God. We did not want to obey God. We did not want to please God. We needed a new nature. We needed to be made alive. We needed to be given a new heart. And so when Christ died for the sins of those who would believe in him, all of the wrath that God had for us because of verses 1 through 3 was absorbed by the perfect sacrifice of Christ. And we were in him. We were incorporated into him. And we were in him when he died. And when he paid as a perfect substitute that death, our sins were upon him and he paid the price that we owed. The sins that we have committed before Christ, the sins that we're committing today, and the sins that we will commit all the way to glory have been paid for on the perfect spotless Lamb of God. And so he raised us up with him. And, and so you see this, this building momentum of this amazing, gracious rescue because it takes us from death and brings us to life. And, and it's all of grace because obviously we had nothing and could have nothing to do with it. And then he raises up, he gives us new life, and it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. And um, we're going to talk about where it goes from here and, and how the blessings and magnanimity of God continues to build in these verses and help us to understand what it means to be raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenlies. But before we move there, I don't want to leave this section without somehow just celebrating. And uh, if, if you know me, um, 
you'll probably know that I love a song called All I Have is Christ. It's one of my favorite songs. It resonates with my soul in terms of the great and gracious work of God. And I'm just going to read a portion of it, and then we'll move on to our next section. I'm not going to sing it, so uh, don't, don't be anticipating. You wouldn't want me to. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. And I don't, I don't want to, I'm not going to start like exegeting this, but uh, the, the reality is that all we do have is Christ, right? That's what we learn in verses 1 through 3. And as a matter of fact, that's all we need in this life is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. So let's see how that grace continues for us. In the next section, we'll just look at verse 6, and that's where we're going to end. And what does it mean to be raised and seated with Christ in the heavens? Well, we were raised, and I, I did mention, like uh, we talked about in Romans, we, Christ is our representative head, and we have been identified with Christ as our representative. And so when God sees the sacrifice that Christ made as a perfect substitute, he sees us dying in Christ. He sees us dying to our old manner of life. And we were buried, indicating that the sacrifice that Christ had made on our behalf was completed, and then we were raised. And so that, that raised in the past with Christ and that historical event was the promise of our resurrection and the power of regeneration for all who would believe. It is being raised with Christ is, is speaking to the fact that we in Christ have a new heart. We go from spiritual death and capable of loving, serving, knowing, enjoying God to now being alive and having a new heart that has a capacity to love and know and serve and enjoy God. And so we have a new heart and it is that new heart then that God works in to continue to draw us to ourself. And it is out of that new heart and that drawing and irresistible grace of God that we are now able to repent, to turn from our sins, and to trust him in faith. And so we are made alive. But beyond being made alive, we are now seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So let's talk about what he means by heavenly realms and then what it means to be seated with him. Uh, I found this quote from MacArthur helpful when it talks about spiritual realms. It says, the supernatural realm, speaking of what is the heavenlies, or the heavenly realm, it's the supernatural realm where God reigns. The spiritual realm is where believers' blessings are, in verse 1-3. It's the, where their inheritance is, in 1 Peter 1-4. It's their affection should be, Colossians 3, set your um, mind on the things above and where they enjoy fellowship with God. We are moved from death and the influence of the world system and the rule of Satan to the heavenly realm with his life and his authority and his rule. And so it's in the heavenly places that we are what? Seated with Christ. Where did Christ go when he was raised? You can answer. Where did Christ go? The right hand of God. Okay, yeah, he went to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And that's a symbol of his rule and his authority. And that is his place to uh, demonstrate his victory. And so after Christ died, he was raised. He ascended to sit at the right hand of God. He restored the dominion that was lost and that rules and will put his enemies under his feet and Lord willing soon. Because we are in Christ, there is a very real sense that positionally we are seated with him and will in reality one day reign with him in the future. So we are, in the tense that he uses here, we are effectively seated with Christ now. 
In this very moment, we are seated with Christ now in the heavenlies. There is a very real sense where we are with him in that position to rule, but the fullness of that is yet to be ours. One author said the Greek verb behind seated is in the aorist tense and emphasizes the absoluteness of his promise by speaking of it as if it had already fully taken place. Even though we are not yet inheritors of all that God has for us in Christ, to be in the heavenly places is to be in God's domain instead of Satan's, to be in the sphere of spiritual life instead of the sphere of spiritual death. But beloved, not only did God raise us up from death to life, we are raised to his throne and seated us with him in the heavenly realm. And if you just carry with you all that happened in verses 1 through 3, how amazing is that? That a rebellious sinner can not only be made right and receive forgiveness, but be raised to a position of honor and rule and authority in Christ. Another author says, In summary, we no longer are dead in our trespasses. Rather, we are alive in the heavenlies with Christ. What we have is both a present and future reality. On the one hand, we have a realized eschatology or belief about end times. All that, that's going to happen in our future, on one hand, is realized. But on the other hand, we wait for this eschatology to be fully realized. The corporate solidarity is a reality now, but in the future, is a reality will be enlarged as we will fully bond with our Savior with a new bodies without sin. And so a helpful way, I think, to think about our union with Christ and, and all of these topics that we've been covering is that this union has implications from our past, implications in our present, and implications in our future. In our past, God placed us in Christ in that historical event of his death, burial, and resurrection. That is something that happened in time, in history, and we were placed in him at that time. But then in our present, when we are saved, what was secured for us in that past historical event is made effective for us by the work of the Spirit. So obviously when Christ was raised a couple thousand years ago, we weren't all of a sudden spiritually alive when we were even born. But it is the, the effectiveness or the realization of what was bought for us at Calvary becomes our present reality when God saves us. And we are given a new position before God in Christ. We are now joint heirs as Christians. We are seated with him. We are viewed as perfect before God because we have the righteousness of Christ upon us. We have every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1.3. We have fellowship with God. All of that is ours today because of our union with Christ. But it's not done there. We have a future reality because of our union with Christ. Practically, in the future or today, we are not everything that we are positionally or will be. And so we battle sin now, but one day we will be glorified. We will have new glorified bodies, and we will never sin again. We have fellowship now, but it's hindered by our flesh and our sin. We do not yet fully experience the actual rule and reign with Christ, but one day we will rule with him in the millennial kingdom and beyond. Our inheritance is something yet to be received. And 1 Peter tells us it is incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading. Beloved, we need to take hold of all this in, in, that is ours in Christ in this life while placing our hope and our future reward in full realization of our union. So what does it mean for us? What does our union mean for us today? Well, understand that we have the same power working in us that we saw in chapter 1 and that transformed us in chapter 2. Look at chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or understand, according to the power that works within us. The power that, that God exerted to purchase back what was broken through the fall the power that raised us up to life, the very power of Christ is in us. And we can use that power in our sanctification, in our lives, in our witness to this world, in our ability to endure until the end. 
And so we need to understand that we have that power working within us. Number two, to remember that his world, this world, is not our home. So if you've been raised up with Christ and you're seated with him in the heavenlies, you're no longer a citizen of this world. You're a citizen of the heavenly realm. You're a citizen of God's kingdom. So act like it. Don't act like verses 1 through 3. Act like verses 4 through 5. Also remember that you are a child of the king, that you as a Christian have a, an element of royalty. You are children of the great king, the great I am. And also, number four, leverage your spiritual blessings. I think when we think about the Old Testament, and if you hang with us through the Old Testament survey, you'll see a lot about the very <coughs> tangible <coughs> blessings that were um, Israel's if they obeyed God and they submitted to God. And it's easy when you look about that of, of, of entering the land and having uh, great crops and, and the fruit of the vine and embracing all in peace among your enemies on all sides. That's very tangible things. And so when I think about our inheritance in Christ and I think about every spiritual blessing, well, what kind of things are we talking about for us as Christians? So we can talk about things like love, the love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts, joy, that, that Christ's joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Strength. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And of course, Galatians 5, and talking about the fruit of the Spirit, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All these things are fruit of the Spirit. They are supernaturally brought and produced in your life as you submit to God and obey God. We have eternal life. We have faith and love. We have grace. We have salvation. We have the treasure of wisdom. We have riches and glory, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. There are so many joyful blessings that are ours in Christ. And so the thing here, and here's the main point, is to live out your position through the power of your present realities. You are positionally something in the future. You will reign with Christ. You are a child with the king. You will be made perfect. Your citizenship is in heaven. So in this life, act like it. And how do you act like it? You act like it through the power of the present realities that are yours because of your union with Christ. And so just to finish out our time, I want to read the last part of all I have is, is Christ. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. And let my soul forever be my only boast is you. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you just overwhelmed at the realities of who you are, your power on display, and how that power intersected our lives in considering our nature before your gracious rescue in our lives. Lord, may we be humbled. May we be in awe and, and mournful of our former life and yet rejoice in what you have done, in the, the cleansing power and forgiveness that comes in Christ. Lord, may we be fueled for obedience because of the demonstrated love of our Savior, and may we live out our future reality in the present with the power that you give us today. May we be faithful to use our ransom life in any way you should choose. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.